see we're all appropriately gathered on the right side of the church and it is the right side of the church depending which which way you're looking that's all uh, just one or two bits of housekeeping there's an exit if we needed it directly behind you as well as the one through which you came before so those are both possible toilets are back through that door in the foyer and along to the left uh, have you signed in? It's an appropriate thing, I think, to do as the uh, Australian experience is showing us about all that. And those of you who are uh, coming regularly to these meetings, and quite some of you are, um, our next session in August will bring the General Secretary, the new General Secretary of the Methodist Church, uh, I don't know whether you've met her at all, Tara Totari, um, good boy, um, down here. We're hoping to bring her down for a few days so you get a chance of getting a sense of what Methodism is like uh, in this part of the world as well as Christchurch. Uh, and the last thing to say is that uh, no doubt there'll be the odd uh, comment or question when we've uh, finished, Wayne. If you're going to do a comment or a question, would you please come up here? And the reason for that is we've been asked to record what Wayne is having to say. And if you don't work through this, we won't even hear what the question was on the recording. So we just remember that and uh, I'll invite you up and we'll get that all sussed. So every welcome to Wayne from our small congregation here and our parish. Um, we're delighted to think that you've now tried yet another uh, kind of career. Uh, are you going to be Pope eventually? We we're just wondering what you're aiming for. Uh, but anyway, you've done almost everything else until now. And here he is, the lecturer in Māori theology. And we're thrilled about that and want to affirm what you're doing, Wayne. So I'll ask Hilda if she would uh, welcome you appropriately into her. Now my hara mai wain ki tēnei uh, wharekarekia ki tēnei uh, uh, 
wahi a kite fa kamara mai ya ma to e nga kai papa nga a wa tango ja ma ri nei nga a wa tanga um o te a to foku pono okay um a he hono re te nei ke ma to ke ko tai mai koe ki te ko ru ki ma to ka tua um he put to pipe ingre he nei te um te aroha he nei te mihi ke a koe Tina Que, Tina Que, Tina Tata Katua. Katsura Kyoto Tato, Tato Ray to Hunga Pacapuno, a ten year at me, a ten year at me, a ten year at me. Tak tahu kau nak kita mihiragi tu atau tu macam ni terangi mohon mana kita tengah yang kumai kita tato rai tenai tenai ra aku tiada suah hari umum na hari tiada nuan nuan nuat su nani fakap kita ingat mian katu kita kau itu suah hine itu faya heura pai kita rongo kita oreo rongo awu kita oreo kita awu kita tu kanohi ah kau kima harau kita rau mata suah hine Tak kutu wana ki tōna wharea i Wan Vera. Kia koe te tsua hene haere, haere, haere atsura. Tēnei rā tō pō whakamutsunga, pō pō, tō karikia whakamutsunga, tō karikia whakamutsunga. Kia tātou rai te hungora, tēnā koutou. Hey, Methodist Mornington Church. Well, first time I've been in a Methodist church and it hasn't fallen down. It's a good sign, it's a good sign. So thank you, Colin, for the invitation. We've been talking for about a year about, about me standing here and babbling on about something. Uh, so thank you for the invitation and thank you, Hilda, for your wonderful words of a welcome. Um, we've suffered a bereavement, and I'll talk about this later in my presentation, with the passing of one of Hilda's um, colleagues at Teachers College, Yvonne Verwa. And Yvonne passed away suddenly last Friday. Tonight is her final night with the family. And tomorrow we will farewell her, farewell her. And we call this a matariki passing. But before I do that, I have one thing I must do. Now, as was mentioned, this has been um, recorded and it will go on YouTube, but I always like to get a selfie, so smile for everyone. Smile, Methodist. <laughs> Thank you. And that will most probably end up on my Facebook page. I, I love walking into churches, and the first thing I do is when I walk into churches, look at the artwork. And uh, they say that churches are very much art galleries. And so Colin was explaining to me about this wonderful cross on the table and looking up there, the banners and whatnot. I, I love going into churches and looking at the artwork. So I'm going to talk tonight about three things. And I want to share tonight about Methodism in Otago, the Māori story. And then we're going to have a break and I'll allow you to ask some questions. Then I'm going to talk about Matariki and the Māori Jesus. Now, Hilda, have you got a guitar? Because we are going to sing tonight. Uh, okay, well, we might not need a, a guitar. Um, and the other thing you might need is a Bible. Do Methodists have Bibles in their churches or? Oh. I'm going to break everyone into small groups to do some small group work by the end, at the end of it all. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad to know that Methodists do have a Bible. <laughs> is this, yes, it's the same one I read. I, I went to um, Crystal's church over here, the Elam church, and they had a Bible reading. And I, I was the only one who actually pulled out a book. Everyone now has pulled out a cell phone. I said, what are they looking at their cell phones for? And somebody said to me, it's called technology, get with it. So, Methodism, Matariki, and the Māori Jesus. Now, here's, uh, hopefully I don't stuff this up. Look at, look at this photo here. It's, it's of Oihi in the Bay of Islands. It's where Samuel Marsden came 
and uh, they say brought the gospel um, and the story goes and we've heard it many many times before Ruatara, a, a, a rangatira from, from Ngāpuhi went overseas came into contact with um, Samuel Marsden and, and one day he said to Samuel Marsden why don't you bring this thing called Christianity and your Bible and bring it to my people and so they may may um, gain the benefits of, of this thing called Christianity. And the story goes, Marsden arrived in 1814, um, Christmas Day, strode ashore and says to them, Behold, I bring you tidings of great joy. And then he preached this wonderful sermon and here's a shot of what it could have looked like. Could have looked like. And of course, we've, that was over 200 years ago. That's the story of Christianity arriving in this country. However, Christianity didn't make it all the way down to the South Island. We have another story. They, they say that the first missionary into Waiponim arrived in Canterbury in 1839, a, a kaifakāko. Kaifakāko is a, a teacher evangelist missionary. And his name was Tawa from Taranaki. And Tawao was taught the Christian faith by a Ngāpuhi Wesleyan Kaifakāko. At his baptism, Tawao took the name Rawiri King, King David, you know, King David from the Bible. And he ended up at Kaukaurārata, at Port Levi, and in the Waimakariri district. And Tawao is acknowledged as the person who brought Christianity to the area where he held regular church services and taught people to read and write. Perhaps a, a bit frustrated that the benefits of Christianity had not arrived in Otago, and, and perhaps he was influenced by Johnny Jones, Tayoro from Otago, and here's a photo of, of Timatinga Tayoro, decided, well, look, Christianity hasn't come to Otago. In fact, it's um, hardly in the South Island. He says, well, that's just simply not good enough. In 1840, he jumped aboard a ship and sailed over to Sydney where he met with the Methodist Mission Board. And he said these wonderful words. I would read it if I could see it, but I can't from here. Would somebody out there like to read those words there? And that was how Christianity came to, definitely to Otago, to Dunedin, and the wider part of the South Island. Of course, Methodists are an enlightened people. They, they say that they are just Presbyterians who know how to read and write. <laughs> and one of my former colleagues said, Presbyterians are just Methodists who know how to put their socks on. <laughs> but the Methodist Mission Board in Sydney heard the request of Tairoa and they said to him, yes we will send you a missionary. And that person was James Watkins. And here's a, here's a list there of the missionaries that, that arrived. James Watkins, Charles Creed, William Kirk, George Stannard. I would suggest that most of you know these names. It's all part and parcel of your, your history here. And, and so they, they came south and, and they did what missionaries did. But James Watkins was... He was he was a great guy. He was quick to implement the idea of a native ministry, Kaifakako. Now, in his short time here, James Watkins is said to have baptized 200 Ngaitahu people. 26 of those people he baptized became Kaifakako under his tutelage. Um, and yeah, that's amazing, 26 people. Look at these figures here. This is research done by Reverend Dr. Hedini Carr. He says from 1844, from 1814 to when Samuel Marsden arrived to 1844, there were actually only 12 European missionaries in the country. There were 295 Māori kaifakāko teachers, native evangelists and teachers. 
10% of those, if the figures are correct, that James Watkins trained 26 of those kaifakaako, that means that 26 of those figures were actually Methodists here in Otago. And I think that is quite significant, very significant. By 1854, there were only 23 European missionaries in the country. There were 558 Māori kaifakaako. Now, people like to give the old European missionaries a hard time, like Arslan and, and um, Henry Williams and all of them. I, I, I'm actually quite light on them. I think they did a lot of good work. You know, 1814, Christianity arrived, so they say, and something else arrived. It was called muskets. Okay. So Hongi Hika from Ngāpō, he went overseas, and he met with, I think it was Queen Victoria, or whoever was on the throne before that, and then he ended up in France, and he met a person who he became good friends with by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte. And they spent time together, and they shared philosophies, and they agreed on one thing. Napoleon Bonaparte said to Hongi Hika, unity will only come through the barrel of a gun. And Hongi Hika said, yes, I agree. And so on his way home, and they say that Bonaparte gave uh, Hongi Hika all this, you know, all this armory and whatnot, and on his way home, he sold it. And all these other treasures he'd been given, he sold as well, got the money and armed himself with as many muskets as he could buy in Sydney. And so when he arrived home in the Bay of Islands, he armed his iwi, they had more muskets than any other iwi, and he launched his war. Um, to bring unity to the country, and he plundered the country from the top of the North Island down to a line around about Topo, and he took hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people north as slaves. And so there was all these slaves from Ngāti Pro, from Te Arawa, from all parts, from Waikato. And then, of course, Christianity arrived, and a lot of those people who owned the slaves read the Bible, and the missionaries said to them, you know, the Bible says this about slavery, da-da-da, Will actually will become Christian and will release these slaves. Of course, those people were released as slaves, and and the the what released them as slaves was this thing called Christianity in the Bible. And they said, well, actually, it's because our owners read the Bible, became Christian. So I think we're going to follow this this as well. And many of those liberated slaves were not to become kaifakaku. I think this gentleman here was one of them. Um, Reverend Te Kote Terato. He was taken as a child slave to Porirua by Taro Paraha. Uh, he became a Christian and was liberated from slavery. And then he was sent to three kings institution in Auckland. Of course, that is the Methodist training school way back in the 1800s, where he trained as a native, um, as a teacher evangelist, a kaifakaku. And then he began his missionary work here in Canterbury, and he took responsibility for, for mission work amongst Māori here in Otago. He's one of those 26. Here's another person I love to talk about. Pā Torumu, Pā Torumu Pū, otherwise known as Bartholomew. Um, he also from Kaitahu, he, uh, James Watkins sent him up to Three Kings Institution in Auckland where he trained and he came back here and he worked for most of his, if not all, his missionary life at Otako Marae where he is assisted various missionaries at Otako and I think it was by around about the late 1960s, early uh, 1860s, 1870s, he became the sole missionary at Otako. Now, Presbyterians were strange people, eh? very strange. And, um, and they kind of got involved in, in Māori mission at Otako, and they said, you will be our Presbyterian missionary. And, um, and they said, uh, we, we will pay you, we'll give you £10, if the people at Otako can match that offer. And so the people at Otako passed the hat around, or the offering plate around, and they came up with £11. So they paid him eleven pounds, and the Senate of Otago, with all the presbytery, with all their wealth, paid him ten pounds. And um, he did more missionary work at Otago 
um, than anyone else. Um, and when you go out to the church at Rotaka Marae, you'll see a photo there of him and his Bible there. They, they say he was a great preacher. Um, he only ever had one sermon. <laughs> he just recycled and he had a monotone voice, and, uh, but a great person. In fact, because of his links with the Presbyterian Church, I'm actually trying to get my church to acknowledge him as the first Māori leader in the Presbyterian Church. Here's some other people, some other of those 26 people. Horomono Pōhio, he became the first kaifakāko at Ruapuki Island in that way somewhere down in Southland. He was also sent to Three Kings Institution by um, James Watkins and he did his training there and came back. He ended up on Ruapuki Island. Huani Wetere Koraku, John Wesley. This is the great thing about Māori, eh? When they were baptised, they wanted an English name. Well, they were baptised by the Methodist Church. So what are the famous Methodist names? Anybody heard of a guy called John Wesley? You might have heard of him, yeah. So when you go to Otaka, you'll meet the Wesley family. They are the descendants of this Wesley here. They, yeah, there's a link there with the Methodist Church. Um, Tare Wetiri, Charles Wesley, I think he was related to John Wesley somewhere along the way. They also became uh, kaifakāko and, and um, did a lot of missionary work amongst their people. Um, others I'm still looking at, um, Te Kahu, uh, um, he became a kaifakākoe at Otaka, and those are just some of the 26 people. Why am I bringing this up? The native ministry was perhaps the greatest legacy of Methodism in Otago. It's actually your story. I'm a North Islander from North Island. It's not my story. I'm a Presbyterian, although we link into it. It's actually your story. And somebody needs to tell the story. And I think it has to be Methodist or a Ngai Tahu person or somebody who is both Methodist and Ngai Tahu. This story needs to be told. I, I was asked recently um, why this needs to be told. Well, when you look at those missionaries that were here, the European missionaries, there's been books written about them. They were all, I don't know, I, I like to say they were controversial characters, and when they're controversial, somebody will write a book about them, or make a documentary about them, or make a movie about them. But nobody has actually published a book on any of these Māori kaifakāko. 558 of them, 26 of them were Methodists here in Dunedin in the 1800s. Next year, the Theology Department at Otago are planning a one-day symposium. I've actually turned it into a two-day symposium. And we are looking at two people, the life and legacy of Tamatanga Tayoro, who was the person who went to Sydney and said, hey, you Methodists, come over here, uh, you're needed. And of course, that happened. So we're going to look at his life and legacy. And the other person is Hipa Tamai Horua, now, when we talk about Māori prophets, you know, we can rattle them off to court, say, Rua Ken and T.W. Rat and Te Whitsi Tohu, you know, all North Islanders. But we always forget that there was a prophet here in Otago called Hipa Tamaihorua. And we always forget that. And Tamaihorua was associated with King Tafio, spent time in, in the King Country with King Tafio, and he became a follower of Pai Māori there, and he brought that back here to his people, and we always forget about that. Why they say in the North Island that, that Samuel Marsden is the person who brought Christianity to the New Zealand, and Ruatara is the gateway who allowed Marsden, who invited Marsden to bring Christianity to the country, I agree with that, but I tend to say that's a North Island story, actually. In South Island, we have another story um, that Tayorua is the gateway to Christianity, the person who invited Christianity to come to this area, and James Watkin is the equivalent to Samuel Marsden. Tayorua is the gateway to Christianity. Um, Tamai Horua is the prophet of Tuaiponamu, and James Watkin is the missionary.
And I would love somebody, a Methodist, a kaitahu, to make a presentation at our symposium next year looking at the legacy of Taioro. And his legacy was the invitation for the Methodist Church to come to this country and also the kaifakako movement here in Otago. Let's take a break. Any questions? Remember, if you've got a question, you've got to come up here and smile. Heard the name. You'll find uh, that Donald has already done some of the work that you're talking about. Mm. And he's a member of this congregation. Oh. And he's a retired Methodist minister. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Why, why is it important? I, I want you to look at these figures here. And this comes from Crystal over here. Oh, is that Matariki, is it? Yeah, I've gone too far. Who will take up the challenge of recording the history of Methodist Māori in Otago? And underneath, you see some facts and figures. There are 14,000 Māori in Dunedin. Now, Crystal actually sent me this figure here. Of that 14,000, only 309 Māori are actively involved and engaged in the church in, in Otago. It's food for thought, isn't it? Why is that, Crystal? <laughs> oh, Ben? <laughs> when you consider that when Christianity arrived, we flocked to it. 26 people from here went off to Three Kings Institution in Auckland, became Kaifagaku. Now, I mean, how many Māori are actually in this church here today? I would say the most Māori in a church in Dunedin are at Pine Hill Presbyterian. One because I'm there, two, my wife is there. There we go, we've doubled that number. <laughs> Hold on. There's, there's a lovely wee booklet, the Māori response to the gospel. Yes. Um, is that, is, did that happen here? Was there, you know, did they try and make it their own? Or did they really swallow it hook, line and sinker and try to be more like a European in their beliefs? Yeah. Hmm. The, the, the article that Hilda's referred to was written by Rua Wairākina. Many of you will know Rua. Uh, from the Methodist Māori Division, um, I don't know, he had a wonderful career. Um, and he wrote an article, actually gave a series of lectures at Trinity Methodist College in Auckland. And he was talking about the Māori response to the Gospel. I actually think it's a classic, it's over 40 years um, old, and, and I use it all the time. And, and Adua makes some really great remarks there, and he says, here's European Christianity, here's Māori Christianity. On Sunday, people go to church to worship God. In the Māori arena, in the Māori world, we don't go to church to worship God. We worship God in the context of what we are doing. So if we're out on the ocean fishing, that is where we will worship God. If we're in the garden harvesting kumara, that is where we will worship God. So God and worship is all about in the context of everyday life. That was just one thing he says. He says another... Uh, a number of other punchy things. So, so Hilda's question was, did we try and make it our own? Absolutely. So when you go to the east coast of the North Island, they talk a story about Piripito Mata Akura, who was a liberated slave, took Christianity to his own people, 1834, and then when the Williams brothers arrived a couple of years later, they were, oh, these people are already Christian. They, 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 they are already Christian. Um, Māori were actually flocking to that gospel. If you, if you listen to read Shapirana Nata, he says, one, we had just been through the musket wars. We were tired of war. Um, and we couldn't, you know, we were preoccupied with this thing called utsu. 
So you do something to me, I'll, I'll, I'll do it back to you. And, and when I finish doing that, I'm going to have you for dinner. And so we got into you know, all that sort of stuff. And we just couldn't find a way out of it. And then these native kaifakaako took the message back and we found a way through it. Um, and so, so yes, we flocked to it. Um, and we made it our own. And then the church arrived. Mm. Sadly, it was Presbyterian Church in and, and my context and said, this is how you have to be Christian and you have to do things like that. And that's when it got all a bit muddly and, and people were saying, yeah, nah, it doesn't fit, doesn't fit. And I still think that there's part of that legacy. Um, I think churches where Māori are concerned also come with a lot of baggage. Um, where Crystal comes from, Pukehinehina. Um, in Tauranga, the Battle of Gate Pa, when you read that history, Māori asked for a missionary, they sent a missionary, they paid him, they built a church in the night before the Battle of Gate Pa. Uh, the missionary called the officers from the Crown into their Māori church and he blessed them and he gave them Holy Communion and the people from Gate Pa who built that church, who called that minister, were made to stand outside their church, looking through the window at their missionary, giving holy community, holy communion and a baptism to the people who were going to kill them in the morning. And when you go to Tauranga, 98% of Māori in Tauranga have no time for Christianity, sadly. Yeah, so there's a lot of baggage that goes with it. Um, there's a lot of baggage that goes with it. And any other questions? Oh, come on, must be another some more questions. Let's go on to Matariki, eh? So we're in Matariki, here we go. Matariki. Um, so the season of Matariki is upon us, and next year it will be a public holiday in 2022. The Labour government decided we need some extra votes, or we'll promise everyone another public holiday. Vote for us. However, it's, it's there. Um, one thing I have been an advocate of is trying to get stories and events from Aotearoa New Zealand into our common lectionary. Uh, you see on, on the screen I only have seven stars, as there is the tradition that I come from. The nine stars uh, comes from Rangi Matamua, who's my nephew. Um, so I let him speak of the nine stars, but I speak of the seven. So I won't talk about um, Pohutsukawa and whatever other stars he, he talks about, simply because I come from those seven stars. Now, I come from the centre of the world, capital of the universe, hub hub of the um, place called Kawero, Kawero, Eastern Bay of Plenty. And here's a shot of two little hills there. Um, one of those hills is called Tiro Tiro Fetsu, meaning to stand and look at the stars. And so I grew up, oh, not far from there. And this was our observatory where our ancestors used to climb up to the top at night and look at the stars. Tiro tiro, look, stars. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of our tribal knowledge has been lost and, and we are in the recovery phase of trying to reclaim some of this knowledge. Some things we did retain, uh, like the names of stars, you know, Matariki, Puanga, uh, Te Autahi. Um, and we say that when Matariki had, uh, appeared, it was a time to start preparing the gardens by turning the soil over. In our whānau, our iwi tradition, when Matariki appeared, we would wait for the first earthquake. And we would simply, uh, Matariki's appeared, they stand there, yep, we can see it. It's getting close to the time where we've got to start planting all that sort of stuff, but let's wait for the first earthquake. And um, the earthquake was the land communicating to us, saying, I'm still in a resting phase, uh, but when the earthquake happened, then we would go, ah, the land has signaled that it's ready to come out of the resting phase and to be worked. And so once that happened, Matariki appeared, earthquake, then we would move out and start turning the soil over. When standing on top of Tiro Tiro Fetsu, we would wait for two particular stars to 
to appear and start moving closer together. Sadly, we lost the name of, names of those stars and, and some of us are looking into old records and whatnot to try and figure out which stars they were. So there were two particular stars we would observe. Matariki, okay, over there. Earthquakes happen, yep, okay, the land is said, I'm ready. And two stars. And we would observe, our ancestors would observe those two stars. And when they started to move together, it was time to start planting. And then when those two stars moved apart, it was time to start harvesting. When I was a child, we always knew when it was Matariki, somebody would die. And um, when I was a minister in Tateko, the period of June and July was possibly the busiest, I, busiest months of, of the year because I'd be running around doing tangis and funerals left, right and centre. When a person died in June, we would say, Katai mai muata matariki. Matariki has arrived early. Um, in July, when a person died, we would say, ah, this is a matariki death. They have died in the time of matariki. Of course, you know, it's quite simple when you work it out. I've kind of figured it out as a minister. Why? Well, matariki appears in the middle of winter. It's cold. It's freezing here in Dunedin. <laughs> And, and when I was growing up, we weren't very rich. There were a lot of people in poverty. Um, and poverty, there were a lot of people hungry, uh, warmth. You know, when I was a student here in Dunedin in the 1990s, I was quite stunned to hear stories of elderly people in Dunedin turning their power off in winter. It was too expensive. And I thought, oh, how shocking. And I guess back home it was like that as well. You know, people would die, they would be elderly, they would be sickly, um, and in the middle of winter, you'd be struggling for, for heat. Of course, things are going to happen, and people are going to die. So, so why should Matariki be included in our common lectionary? Well, actually, there's a strong Christian element to Matariki. One of the outcomes of the New Zealand land wars was the destruction of many Māori customs, and Matariki was one of them. However, the Ringatsu leader Tukotsi kept Matariki alive by giving it a Christian aspect and incorporating it as a central focus in the his church liturgy. He called it the Hudai, the 1st of July. Hudai July. And on the 1st of July, he would call all his followers together. He would say to them, Matariki has appeared Bring your old seeds and your old tubers. Bring your new seeds and your new tubers. Bring them all together. And so people would arrive on the 1st of July in Fitsianga, just out of Takaha. I think Greg and uh, Hilda have got a holiday house there somewhere on beautiful coast, east coast. So all his followers would arrive with the old seeds and old tubers and new seeds and new tubers. And they would say, OK, lay them down here. Here's a box. Put everything in there. And so they put the old seeds and new seeds, old tubers and new tubers into the box. He would mix them all up and then he would bless them. And after he had blessed them, somebody would take them away to a stream and start the germination process. Later on, there would be another gathering where people came and collected their seeds and tubers after they had been germinated. Tukorti explained it like this. Matariki has appeared. It's time to get ready and start planting and I've asked you to bring the old seeds and the old tubers and mix them with the new seeds and the new tubers and we'll bless them and germinate them and then you can take them away and plant them and watch them grow and he explained it like this the old seed and the old tuber has to die in order for new life to emerge Jesus also had to face the same fate as those seeds and tubers he had to die as well. But as we profess, Jesus died and he arose on the third day. He walked out of the tomb. Jesus is the new life that comes from old life. And that was the meaning of Matariki and that event of mixing the old seeds and the new seeds together. If Christ did not die, he said, he would not have been resurrected. If Christ did not die, and had not been resurrected, he would not have walked out of the tomb. 
if Christ did not die and was not resurrected and did not walk out of the tomb, he would not have ascended. If Christ did not ascend, Pentecost would not have happened and the church would not have been born. For in order for all of that to happen, Jesus had to die for new life to come forward. It was Christianity, it was Christianity that helped Matariki stay alive by giving it a Christian meaning and making it the central aspect of the Māori lectionary. So for Ringatsu, and here's a shot of Te Kōtsu, for Ringatsu, Jesus Christ is Te Kōpura, the seed, the new life, the seed that arises from the death of old life, the old seed. Jesus is Te, Kō, te Kōpura. Here's some Matariki events that have happened recently in the last month or two. Um, Matariki Fano Hui, I think the Baptist stole a march on everyone and had a big, huge, huge Hui and, and Kapahaka and whatnot. And then um, Crystal over there um, organised a, a potluck dinner at uh, Elam. Then it was just simple. She said, come, let us all eat together. Bring a plate. Bring a plate. So we had oysters and crayfish, and what else did we have that night? <laughs> um, service of Remembrance. You know, Knox Church, um, down on George Street, they decided to celebrate Matariki by having a service of remembrance. One of the, they say at Matariki, one of the first things that happens is that you actually give thanks for the, the last year, and you remember those who have who have passed on. If you read Langi Matamu, I think he goes a bit deeper than that. So Knox Church sort of jumped on board that bandwagon and said, "We'll celebrate Matariki by having a service of remembrance." And I've been involved with Flagstaff Church. Uh, 2017 was their first ever Matariki, and, and it's grown to a whole weekend. And they do some really wonderful things. Friday night, I think they bring the young people in. I don't know what young people do. They do what young people do. Um, they, they, they looked at Matariki and everything that's involved and they said, well, look, it's about stars. It's about the land. And they said, look, there's a stream floating past in our church. And oh, it's absolutely in a disgusting state. You know, I think there were some car bodies in there and, and people throw their clothes and their rubbish in. And they said, actually, why don't we clean it up? And so... They had a, a working bee one weekend where they cleaned it up and they planted native trees along that stream and they put a walkway there. And then I showed up and said, oh, no, that looks like hard work. And they said, well, while we're doing that, why don't you old people have a singing something in the church? And so we had a, uh, a musical event where we learned to sing some songs and Natalie Yeoman was there. Um, Malcolm Gordon, I think, was there recently. Um, the Flagstaff Community Choir was there. So while all those young people were out there, us old people in the church keeping warm, learning to sing songs and whatnot. And then at five o'clock, we said, let's all get together, put your tools down, come in, and let's have a concert. Let's have a, a lounge concert in wonderful fishing chip shop across the road. And people went and got their fishing chips and their... And, and we all just sort of sat there and, and people got up and did items and, and I just sat there eating fish and chips and drinking my Zero Coke. Wonderful, wonderful event. And then the Sunday, they decided, well, actually, it's future orientated. Let's look to the future. Let's engage our community. And so they invited the school kapahaka in, uh, the community choir in, and some other groups in. And it was absolutely jam-packed, wonderful community engagement service. And I thought, this is it, I'm going to belong to this church. And I went back the following Sunday, and there were all oh, about 14 people. And I said, where's everyone? I said, well, actually, this is us. <laughs> but I, I thought those events, actually, um, were quite special. And it's great to see churches getting involved. Um, here's some possible biblical themes for Matariki. Um, it's about seeds, you know. It's about light. It's about stars, and I, I love stars. You know, you, Matariki is in the Bible there. I think Job is having a bit of a conversation with God and others, and, and um, Matariki comes up, and mm -hmm. where were you when 
know, Mbataraki was set in place or something like that. Um, so it's about stars, it's about reading the stars. Um, and I like to call it navigating by the stars or navigating our faith. There's a wonderful story in the, the Gospel of Luke where Jesus is born and there's a couple of guys who navigate the stars and they have all this knowledge about the stars and they read the stars and hey, there's a star, might have been, Mataraki, who knows, and it's shining brightly and they followed that and it led them right to the manger. So in, in Māori we say we navigate by the stars, we navigate our faith and we also weave our faith. It's about the land, hmm? it's about the land. Uh, it's about new life and old life. It's about stars, land and people. So what will Mornington Methodist Church do next year? Now, this is where I'm going to break you into. You are now going to do some work. I want you to break into one row, two rows, three rows, and Colin can jump into the second row. I want you to form a little group for 15 minutes and talk about Matariki and design some sort of liturgy that could take place here in this church next year. Hmm. Just have a conversation. What, what could you do? And then we'll come back in about 10, 15 minutes and we'll share in the group. And then I'm going to teach you a Matariki Waiata. Shot out one great big seed head, 
and that's now mature. And I'll chop it off. I did last time, but nobody was interested in my seeds last year. But I reckon we could do something. Seedy. I'd like to do something <laughs> seedy, and I don't know whether there's just a wee bit of space out the back there. Oh, it's quite a bit of space out there. Where something <laughs> could grow. Like, I didn't think you'd make what it was, whether whatever you plant in the middle of winter. Garlic. Yes. I tell you what it works. Just, so it's just space. Uh, so it's just a symbol of yams work. I've got yams in the ground now and going to sprout. And that, that's because I didn't harvest them. Um, so we don't grow primaries this far south, but we grow yams all year. And they're great. Yeah. But they're yeah. they're yeah. still red. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's got pumpkin seeds everywhere, it's got fruit seeds everywhere. And yeah. we can start them off inside, can't we? Yes. Yeah. I know. Um, Building. We had a we had a church garden and children were allowed to go out and pick strawberries on a Sunday afternoon. Yeah. It was a treat. We have a black boy peach tree that Junior King gave us a seed from. And we've given so many people black boy peach trees. We've got room for another one. Yeah. <laughs> oh well. Got one because I was just not I'm puzzled about what he said. The old seeds and the new seed. I don't know what he means. Um, he was talking about Kumara. I think, I think there was a bit of um, that the old seeds in the box would die. I hope that's on the TV. <laughs> Right, just speak up the, old, the old seeds in the box would die and they would be hung like the compost yes. and the new seeds yes. were growing oh, and oh. Like, especially the old Kumara tulips and the Kumara are quite good, they sprout the Kumara's old tulips and they would be in the sun as well as the old ones dying. Yes, I, I know that's what he said. Yeah. Um, but where do you get the new ones at that time of year? People brought them. Some fruit trees have been wrapped. Mm. I also like the idea of inviting some kind of pumpkin crops into the church. We were here, we were, weren't we? Absolutely. I didn't know about this place, three candles. You had the little bit of three candles. And the schools do quite a lot these days. The children do the songs so that they remember the names of the stars. Yeah, they do them as well. Some of them do little plays or stories. <coughs> um, <coughs> a granddaughter did with the class, and the yeah. children in the class, uh, and little groups so were so made up. Yeah. I've got the actual book of a story about so some of them, and into a script, and then organising very simple costumes and presenting it. <laughs> I'm still thinking about the Christmas thing. Glenavon has the most amazing Christmas tree, you know, which is a resource. And, and the school really loves having the Christmas stuff around at Christmas time. But if we brought the tree up here, I mean, we didn't try to make it like Christmas. In, where when it usually is, but just take the aspects of that are appropriate, like the, the star story, 
and the newness of the new life. Because our Easter is important. We don't have the benefit of all the imagery of the bulbs and the, you know, bunnies and chickens and all that stuff. But we could merge Christmas and Easter in our direction. We could still have the stars on the tree. Yes. Yeah, well, that, that's what it has only got. It's got oh, stars. It's got nothing else. Just stars and the lights that go on. Um, I'd really love to do that. And, and of course, there's food things that you can do, special things. Like, like fruit cake and things keep. You know, um, not anything I make. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and the present giving, I think the um, mutual present giving, a seed swap, you know, if you bring names, seeds. Uh, I've been to a seed swap before and I got um, red, uh, scarlet runner, bean seeds. It wasn't actually a swap because they didn't want any money or anything. But you can just have the general all in together, gift giving of seeds, and, and you can use the imagery of eggs like we do at Easter. Egg is a seed, you can have decorated eggs. <laughs> what came first, the chicken or the egg? The children would love to ask you. I was reading the story with the children and it was about the same as not said about the remembrance of the people who died during the last year. And it seemed to be significant for our little girls because there was a girl in their area that died in a, in a car accident. And they said when they went to the Mattery star in the sky and it just seemed to be a moving on from the grief of the same people. Mm. So I think it would be nice if we did, you know, if we told the people we were connected with. Denominational um, pre Christmas thing in the North East Valley. It, it was um, it was a star story and it can be resurrected. I've often wondered where I could use it again. <laughs> We still have to go by the stars and the GPS, but it's still satellite. That guy at the museum is a great enthusiast. He's come to the planetarium at the museum and look into the night sky. But, you know, it's a bit of a It's wonderful. That's amazing. And a lot of actors could be um, family, family, all right. Yeah, 
so people didn't think they were going to be um, pressed at. Um, all, that's, um, all that's Christian about it is the venue, you know, just um, take away the sense of, you know, that we're trying to get them to come to church. Um, in fact, <laughs> you know, advertising is being in the hall. Oh, well, we're well, using, using, using the church for the sake. Yes, absolutely. Just trying not, trying not to do what they feel. So many people have been in the near future. I think we're fortunate that people do come out, that people do come in for concerts. That's right, that's right. absolutely. Yes, yeah. 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 Okay, folks, let's let's come back let's come back together. So, 15 minutes isn't very long um, to discuss you know, the concept of matariki and how to put that into our lectionary and how to do a matariki service. But I gave my students this opportunity on Zoom lecture, about 34 of them, and I gave them 15 minutes, and, and what came back was absolutely outstanding. Two weeks ago, we had our, our Māori theology course at Ohope Marae, and I gave them, broke them into three groups, and so I and I gave them the same order rule about matariki and all of that. And I said, your job now is to, to design and deliver our evening devotions for this week um, while we're at the marae. And group one, they did an outstanding service. Group two, an outstanding service. Group three, they had two days to work on it. And, and they had some outstanding things that they came forward with. So while you had your little groups, I had my little group. And I stand sort of here having a conversation with myself. What do you think? Well, this is what I think. And so my group came up with this thing for, for Matariki uh, for next year. It's about stars, stars shining in the night sky. It's about light in the dark. And so I am going to, next year, I am going to have a candlelight service. So that's my idea for next year. I've got no idea what's going to happen, but... I looked at the candle and said, yes, Jesus talks about being the light of the world. Yeah. So I'm going to have a candlelight service this year. Group one, I heard a lot of discussion going on and heard some debate going on about whether Bowdoin Barrett should be in the All Blacks again. Or <laughs> Would somebody from group one like to come up onto this microphone and, and just share some of the things that you came up with? My name's Crystal. Um, so our group talked about other stuff. <laughs> I railroaded the conversation um, in terms of just more political debate. Uh, just not a joke either. <laughs> just the reality of what it looks like to be uh, Māori. We're not, uh, all of our members don't attend this church specifically. Uh, so firstly, I didn't com feel completely comfortable. And I may have misread the proposed uh, idea <laughs> of what we were meant to be doing. Um, but we did hear a little bit about what Knox did in terms of their um, remembrance service and to me it sounded like a really powerful service so I encourage and commend that service as a model uh, for this church to possibly look at so I think our main theme was look at what other people have done and possibly just steal from them or share, share, right? Bring your share, seeds. Share so Knox brought their seed from last season with the idea that you could possibly use it for your season for next, taking in the idea that you brought us from Te Kōtsi. So that was what we definitely spoke about and mm. exactly how we uh, came to the conclusion. 
that possibly you should ask Māori. Uh, that, was <laughs> that, was, that was the conclusion I asked uh, our group to kind of come to, is that maybe engage with Māori in the local area and encourage them to be a part of forming what it looks like for this church to um, do a Matsuriki service. Mm, mm. So those are our two key ideas. You're welcome, Minister. So, so hang on, so, so I'll ask you the question, you can answer on behalf of the, your group. <coughs> Excuse me, you talked about the seed. Right. In the Bible, can you think of a particular reading about seeds in Jesus? Yep, definitely there's seeds. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple seeds uh, parables yeah. of sowing the seeds. Yeah. In the different soils. Different soils. We actually did talk about soil. Yeah. About that. There are some soils that can be cultivated in order to grow more fruitful seeds. And so our beautiful lady there mm -hmm. had the, spoke about her church specifically, how they have spent time as Pākehā, in a Pākehā context, cultivating the soil of their church mm -hmm. in order for moments like this to be able to happen. That it was, they were able to see fruit in their mm. um, service ultimately Absolutely. because they had pre cultivated it. Because there was that conversation about is it like there are churches where it's not so easy to do mm. Māori things within them. That was, mm. and so she said within her church, because they had put in that groundwork in toiling that soil and mm. placing the seed in the right spot, not just throwing it wayward, mm. that they were able to see some fruit. That's why we secondly commend that service at the <laughs> yeah. so. I, I remember last year, um, I think we just come out of lockdown and I think we went back to level two or level three. And I chair a Māori haora group. And when it came to Matariki, they went around to all the homes with just little packets of seeds mm. and dropped them off at everyone's home and little instructions and how to grow these seeds. and. When we moved to Port Chalmers, I still had those seeds and threw them into the garden and, and we've had green vegetables all year round. Brilliant. Hmm. You could do multiple kinds of seeds. You could do the physical seed or you could do like a metaphorical seed with those stories that you taught from those kaifakako yeah. that are definitely seeds from the Methodist movement. Hmm. That is an old seed bringing new life once again by allowing those stories to be told once again. Mm. Possibly even having a storyteller's night. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, in August, that hiritsuri koka is the Māori word for August, mm. and it talks about like darkening your knees. Mm. So there's a whakaaro, a story around gathering closely to the fire so that we could hear these stories to be told um, until your knees are blackened. That's the whole idea of that, uh, mm. that what I've been told of that month mm. name. And so possibly having a theme around that with the seeds of, of what you've sown in the past, you know, old new seed again. Mm -hmm. So, you're welcome. Hey, thank you, group one. Thank you. My, um, one of the groups that, that I was working with, and, and they did decide to do something around seeds. And so they made all these little seed pods and they gave them out and you had to write something on it that you would like to have prayed about and we had to put them all into a box and and then mixed it all up and then you had to come up and sort of you know, choose one and whatever was written on that seed you had to take away and pray in your own time and your own way in your own space. I looked into the box and said, hey, nobody chose mine. <laughs> and, and I think the facilitator said, well, you know, when there's the sower, yeah, there were some seeds that fell, fell by the wayside and, <laughs> and there were some bad seeds as well. <laughs> so group two, what did you come up with? Well, again, we had a wide spread of responses, uh, including one of our number uh, who still is carrying, in a sense, the burden of guilt mm -hmm. for what took place uh, in the wars. Yeah. Uh, so amongst us, there is still uh, the stain of that. Mm. Uh, and we drive, every time we go along the harbour, past yes. the places where Māori were imprisoned yeah. and stood in the water to build those walls, mm -hmm. so it's part of our Dunedin culture as a whole, that knowledge. But I'm happy to say, I think I could be happy to say, Wayne, <laughs> that last Sunday we had a Matariki service mm -hmm. uh, focusing on the notion of the stars, 
Though I have to tell you that I think Matariki as the seven stars is very much a North Island idea. <laughs> Kawanga is the star which so many hmm. people in the South hmm. uh, look to uh, for the same kind of signals, of course, but in fact that's the one. So I spent some time talking about hmm. the way in which a scientist understands the great blue star, which is regal mm. in mm. scientific terms, and puanga uh, in Maori terms. So we've mm. done that. The other thing that I think I should say that we are conscious of having done is trying to reinforce our relationship with Maori at the chapel at Otako. Mm. And you're quite right. Maori and Methodism go together very Absolutely. well in this yeah. particular area. Mm. So uh, we spent, we took the whole uh, all of Methodist congregations and said, let us gather at Otako, and that's where we had um, a, a service. So, patently, that could happen again Absolutely. at the season of Matariki and, and for that particular purpose. We uh, here begin our service with Maori language, mm. we end our service with Maori language and the grace. And the choir at this very moment are busy le learning a Maori song in Te Reo, uh, because I think we do understand, are uh, coming to understand, mm. that unless you enter the language uh, of a nation, uh, you haven't learned much about them. Mm. Um, so we're endeavouring to do that. Uh, what I think collectively we're beginning to see, oh yes, we were, we were struck by the notion of honouring key people. Hmm. Uh, now I've got no doubt that Donald Phillips can give us as probably as much as we know about each of them, but the idea of giving them a life, perhaps turning them into a drama, um, hmm. or singing about them, uh, and just taking figures of that nature and honouring them. I think we know there were Maori workers here, but almost none of us realised just how important they were. Uh, and the last thing I just want to toss out from our group uh, is the importance that Watkins showed mm. of educating in the faith, so that education, either from a Maori educating Pākehā uh, or vice versa, uh, becomes really important. <laughs> We should do much more than we do, mm -hmm. uh, or, and we're doing it tonight, by the way, thank you. Uh, you are doing some of it for <laughs> us. We think that education is absolutely crucial for a congregation uh, mm -hmm. to keep educating itself in the language, in the culture, mm -hmm. uh, and we work both towards the Maori world and also interculturally uh, towards the Muslim world as well. Mm -hmm we've set our hearts on. Uh, so I think you've come to a congregational group um, which says amen, <laughs> amen to what you were urging. Yeah. Uh, and thank you for helping us in those directions. Mm. A yeah. couple, couple of questions, Colin. Just, just, just stay there since I got you on the podium. Yes. Um, has everyone actually seen Matariki? Check out your local observatory, which is around here somewhere. Last yeah, year, yeah. They, they had a, you, know, you could go up at 5.30 in the morning. So we went up at 5.30 in the morning. They had the telescopes, they had somebody talking about it. It was actually wonderful to see Matariki and Puaka. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and I looked through the telescope and I say seven. My nephew says nine. Yeah. I actually saw 11. Yeah. And of course, with a director at the museum, yeah who was fascinated by the whole business of stars, yeah. that's a great uh, advance for us. Yeah. 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 He drives in he drives from in. Portobello, uh, seeing the star world, and then writes a column about it in the yeah. newspaper. <laughs> I, I think, think the idea of going to the church at Otaku yeah. Marae, yeah. that is absolutely, they yeah. would love it out there. Yeah. I've been out there so many times and they've said to me, when are you going to come out and do a service? Yes. Oh, I'll get there, yeah, oh, I'll get there. <laughs> You're Presbyterian, they're the same as Methodist? Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> so I think they would absolutely love that, that idea. And, and I do know that they would love somebody to go out there often and do services. Yes. Uh, another idea that I'm looking at is 
The Anglican Church at the, I was going to say the temple, Ben, not, not the temple, the cathedral, they have an 8 a.m. service on Wednesday night, Wednesday morning, Thursday. Thursday, Thursday morning, and I'm actually looking at something similar, yes, but yes. an ecumenical yeah, service, yeah. I don't know, morning, e afternoon, evening, once a week, so I'm looking for a church to, to hold that in, and then, you know, if you say to me, come and do it at Mornington Methodist, I'd, I'd love to. Um, your choir are learning uh, a song in, in Te Reo Māori, I'm going to finish by teaching a Matariki song, so yeah. I'll leave that here as a gift to your choir. Yeah. <laughs> So well, thank, you, you <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Group Tech. Thank you, Group And they say the best always goes last, so let's hear from Group 3. Uh, I think our group was very taken with the idea of seeds and um, seed uh, swapping for mutual benefit. And... Um, and the fact that the church uh, calendar and celebrations are all upside down for our hemisphere of the world, mm -hmm. and in fact we should be doing Christmas uh, more around the Matariki time, and so why shouldn't we tell some of the Christmas story, especially about the stars, um, have a Christmas tree that we're a tree that is covered in stars as a, you know a focus. Um, talk about Jesus being like a seed. Um, Helen's written it, already written a special star story she used for four, so we could use that. It's called Star Bright. Um, uh, we, um, we might even go outside to um, uh, plant a new garden outside of uh, plants like yams and, and strawberries and maybe a fruit tree that would continue to provide um, fruit food um, in the years, year to come. Um, Eldon has a particularly good store of seeds, Andrea says. That would be fantastic to be able to use some of those in it, Andrea. <laughs> um, uh, so yes, uh, the story of, of, of Christmas seems actually mm -hmm. more to fit at Matariki for us. Um, we'd also like to invite the school kapahaka from the area to be part of that. Um, and we also like the idea of remembering those who died in the past mm. year um, um, and mentioning them as well somehow um, and tying in with what you've said about um, viewing the stars. We'd love to go to the museum planetarium mm. as a group um, and, and learn and see and share a cup of tea afterwards, uh, bring the whole farm over, things like that. So we, we'd possibly start here and have some other activities as well. But yeah, it's more like um, Christmas. Christmas, yeah. Um, stand, stand there, Holder. <laughs> um, just, just a couple of comments, you know, we're talking about the influence of the Northern Hemisphere on us. One of our leaders up, up home, Lua Kenana, was. Um, he was very much against the influence of the Northern Hemisphere to the point where he actually moved Christmas Day to the 24th, 23rd, 24th of December. He, he felt way back in 1916 that Christmas was all about commercialism, even then. Wow. And so he said, look, we're not going to do Christmas on the 25th. This is what's going to happen. On the 23rd of December, we will all get together at the Marae and we will have dinner and then we'll go into the whanui. I will do a service and then each person is to stand up and speak about your events from the last 12 years because, because Christ is going to be born into the world again. Mm. And so let's get it all out. So when you move into Christmas Day, it's all about waiting for Christ, worshiping God, Christ, all of that, listening to the story again. And that would go right through the night. The last one I attended in 2000 and 16, I was very rude, got to me and I was... <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm sure it had been long enough for you to fall asleep as well. And, and so people got everything out, really to accept Jesus back into their life in the morning. And then 7 o'clock in the morning, we got up, we had this wonderful banquet, there was our Christmas dinner, and then we were free to, to celebrate Christ being born into the world again. And we didn't get involved in any of the commercialism um, that was going on around us and the rest of the world. 
listen to your group, it sounds like very much about community engagement. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes, community. And we, um, we're very pleased that, um, although some people will hesitate to come to a church building for things, um, many of them have been in here for concerts. Yeah. Um, or, the, you know, children have played music in here, I think so. Um, it, we're hoping it feels a bit more like a community venue rather than a, mm. the church they imagined it mm. might be. Yeah, we also thought that we maybe t if we if we stretched this Mataniki time over several weeks, yeah. we would also perhaps include some of the Easter, you know, new life stuff as well, the death and resurrection with the seed. So it's, um, yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, group three. Now, that, that was only 15 minutes. Imagine what could happen if we had more time. So, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's, it's almost nine o'clock. I want to leave you all with a gift. It's um, a Matariki Waiata. Um, and, and I'm giving this to you to take away and to use. And, and I'm standing here tonight with one of my absolute heroes person who was integral to this book, Colin Gibson. I, every time I take a service, I will only use hymns from, from this because it's, it's about us and it's about faith in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And so this song was written way, way back, I don't know, 1600, whatever. It's got some old tune. And one of my aunties, Mary Caton, she was the second Māori woman to ever be ordained um, in the 1970s. And she looked at it and she said, oh, look, this is about New Year's and, and we celebrate Mataliki. So she picked up the guitar and she sang it to the, the tune of Old Lang Syne. And so I'm going to, so let, let's sing it together to the tune of Old Lang Syne. Um, it goes something like this. I'm, I'm hopeless at singing. I'll apologise now. Ete atua ko kwe neira te kaia fina mai te pa e ora ai a i e ne mate nui ko kwe te maru maru mai e a like saying no, I mean at the end. <laughs> <laughs> so just a spelling mistake, I just saw um, the, the last verse here. It's supposed to be Hekayaf in uh, my, so I think there's supposed to be a W in there. But that's my gift to you. Please take it away. Um, and yeah, so thank you 
so much for, for inviting me here tonight. singing. <laughs> 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 